right, guys, we're going to get started with our EM debates, and uh, we're going to do our pro first, which yes. is Dr. Lucchese. I want to thank Dr. Willis um, for giving me the pro antibiotic and anterior nasal packing, um, uh, which was something I would never, ever, ever, ever do. Uh, but um, it was, and you'll see from my lecture, it's very frustrating. I learned a lot. I actually learned a lot. Um, so I want to thank the controversies team. I'm, I'm not going to call them the controversies in medicine team, but they're very helpful. Uh, Drs. Allen, uh, Benevas, uh, D'Souza, and uh, Dr. Kim. Um, just to, uh, because you sometimes see this on some of the board questions and in-service kind of questions, anterior and posterior nasal bleeds, anterior, easy to control, you know, usually venous, uh, Kessel uh, box plexus, posterior, a little bit more difficult to control. Uh, sphenopalatine artery, usually arterial bleeds. So this is sort of an ASEP statement, which I found very interesting. And when I highlight things in yellow, that just shows you the bizarre uh, um, problem I face with having very poor literature out there, which is why it's probably controversial. Antibiotic use in nasal packs, the use of systemic antibiotic prophylaxis while, uh, while nasal packs are in place to prevent uh, infection or toxic shock syndrome is controversial. Packs are often impregnated with antibiotic ointment prior to insertion. Systemic antibiotics directed against Staphylococcal aureus are often used as uh, nasal packing. Several studies suggest the use of systemic antibiotics following nasal packing should not be mandatory. Although I am, uh, I, uh, of all the available systemic, uh, systematic reviews did not show a significant benefit to the use of antibiotics with nasal packing. The individual studies in the review were underpowered to detect prevention of rare complications such as toxic shock syndrome. Given the lack of um, convincing data, the risk and benefits of antibiotic use in patients with packing in place should be evaluated. So this is uh, Biggs Nightingale. This is uh, at Al. Uh, should uh, prophylactic antibiotics be used routinely in the stack of patients with nasal packs? Um, Annals of the Royal College of Surgery in England, um, generally accepted. That systemic antibiotics use is um, accepted in posterior nasal packing. 57 patients they studied with anterior nasal packing were presented to an ENT clinic in Great Britain. Were studied follow-up telephone calls six weeks later to ask <coughs> if they had any symptoms of uh, infection. Uh, systemic antibiotics are unnecessary in the majority of uh, uh, epistaxis patients with nasal packs. A number of patients were excluded who did not have completed accurate information. In the, uh, um, in the patient notes, blah, 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 uh, full data sets. This is Biggs, Nightingale, et al., um, the uh, Annals uh, of um, Royal College of Surgery in England. This is 2013. This is a little diagram, and basically what they're saying in the diagram is that anterior packing, no, posterior packing, yes, um, inpatient, yes, um, but I found it, you know, again, no data really to support that. Wang, um, Peden, et al., are prophylactic antibiotics necessary with nasal packing? Systematic review, American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy in 2017. Six studies of the total of 990 patients met inclusion criteria patients who presented with epistaxis or septoplasty. So these were also post op patients and received anterior nasal packing. No signs or symptoms of nasal or sinus infection, no patients with toxic shock syndrome. There is a paucity of literature that, support, that, uh, that reviewed the need for prophylactic antibiotics and anterior nasal packing. The studies were underpowered to detect a difference. So are you getting a trend here? Um, Murano, um, uh, Rucato, et al., prophylactic systemic antibiotics for anterior epistaxis treated with nasal packing in the ED, the American Journal of Emergency Medicine 2019, retrospective review of ED patients greater than 17 years of age. The discharge diagnosis of epistaxis was performed over a five-year period. Over half the patients, 53.7%, had anterior packing um, or prescribed antibiotics. The rest were not. No significant difference in infection rates between the two groups. I'm not stealing Dr. Blaze's thunder, but p-value is 0. 263. Um, <laughs> wow, and that got published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Further randomized control studies are necessary to definitively support this practice change. So, 
no discussion. I wasn't. I did extensive reviews. I did. I did all the search engines. I did uh, Dr. Schechter's uh, uh, Google.com. I did. Uh, you know everything. Anterior versus posterior packing. Not much written. Anterior uh, admitted versus discharge patients, patients with comorbidity, diabetes, immunocompromised, you know, um, not much. Um, the elder patients, patients with social, their social environments, uh, their reliability to follow up, really not really any good data. So let's talk about facial fractures. Um, Mudlinger, um, Borsuk, uh, et al., uh, antibiotics for facial fractures, evidence-based recommendations compared to experience-based practice. Cranial uh, maxillary trauma uh, reconstruction 2015. With this place, they went to a symposium of ENT doctors. So, a lot of the ENT docs are very much antibiotic advocates, right? I even talked to some of our ENT docs who said, you know, you send patients to our clinic for follow up and you didn't put them on antibiotics. It's crazy. So, I, just, I said, you have to show me the evidence where, where it really does work. Surgical intervention is often necessary in the management of some cranial maxillofacial fractures. Expert opinion uh, survey. So this is what these 17 otolaryngologists said. They divided into upper face, 47% gave antibiotics, mid face, 47%, probably the same people, mandibular, 69. So the only thing that I see is okay, so maybe it's re reasonable to give them mandibular. Right? Study support uh, the use of uh, perioperative antibiotics in all facial thirds and uh, um, perioperative antibiotics in comminuted mandibular fractures. Overall studies were poor quality. These are all quotes that actually came out of the paper. Uh, clinical practice, clinical practices that are at odds with the literature recommendations are understandable in situations where the literature is poor, but should be changed if they are at odds with well-designed studies that address the clinical scenario. So remember that statement. Morris, uh, Kelman, are prophylactic antibiotics useful in the management of facial fractures? Uh, Laryngoscope uh, 2013. Current evidence supports the use of prophylactic antibiotics in mandibular. There is insufficient data to evaluate the efficiency, uh, the efficacy of prophylactic antibiotic use in non mandibular facial fractures or in isolated fractures of the mandibular. Andreessen Jensen, a systematic review of prophylactic antibiotics in the surgical treatment of maxillofacial fractures. Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, 2006. A systematic review of the literature revealed four studies that filled most of the requirements of being randomized control studies. I've never seen that statement in a paper in my entire life. They filled most of the There is threefold uh, decrease in the incidence of rate rate of mandibular fractures, uh, infection in, the, in mandibular fractures when treated with antibiotics as opposed to no prophylactic antibiotics. The evidence uh, for benefit of prophylactic antibiotics in mandibular condyle fractures and fractures of the mid-face is less powerful. Um, louder, um, uh, shark, um, et al. antibiotic prophylaxis in the management of complex mid-face Frontal sinus trauma, uh, laryngoscope 2010. Patients seen uh, for traumatic facial injuries in a six year period, 223 was the end. In the retrospective analysis, all patients received perioperative antibiotics. Isolated uh, mandibular fractures were excluded from the study. The benefit of infection rate was only seen in the cohort of patients with multiple fractures. P value very good, open fractures, P value 0 0.034. Conclusion was that antibiotics may be warranted in patients with severe facial trauma. Uh, early core uh, and Brigham et al. Uh, utility of prophylactic antibiotics in non operative facial fractures, the Journal of Cranial Facial Surgery in um, 2016. Total of 289 patients admitted to a level one trauma center with non operative facial fractures from 2012 to 2014. Primary outcome of the, uh, was the incidence of facial soft tissue infections. 50 patients received no antibiotic prophylaxis. 63 patients completed a short course, less than five days, and 176 patients received long term antibiotics greater than seven days. No soft tissue infections were identified in any. Patients. Prospective randomized studies are needed to provide further clinical recommendations. So, 
is really not good data out there. It's, it's starting to get frustrating. So then I said, I'm going to use, <laughs> I'm going to use my, uh, my, my, use this to my advantage. I'm not going to, I can't come up here and tell you. So lessons learned by me um, in this controversy. I think controversies in medicine are great, um, but maybe there's clinical variation because there's not good data um, to, for, for clinic clinicians to follow. So uh, clinical practice, again, the same statement, clinical practices that are at odds with the literature recommendations are understandable in situations where the literature is poor, but should be changed if they are at odds with well-designed studies that address the clinical scenarios. So maybe those situations, you have clinicians that are relying on their colleagues, relying on their mentors, relying on you know, peers, because there's no science out there. So maybe the, what we're gonna find in this series of, of uh, this lecture series of controversies in medicine is that when there's no good data out there, clinician, clinical, um, um, clinical pathways vary dramatically. And that's what I really found in this situation. We'll see if Dr. Blasian comes up with uh, something. Um, these are my references. And one last thing I want to say is uh, this is um, um, Acadia National Park in Maine. Um, if you ever decide to go hiking, do not listen to Dr. Silverberg because <laughs> he tried to kill me. <laughs> my family, the night. <laughs> First trip, we went on a trail called uh, Beehive, and literally there was about an 18-inch wedge that it was a flat mountain, and behind you was a fatal fall, and there was nothing to keep you from that, and you had to scale like this. <laughs> so he told me to go on Beehive. So the night, the first night that we went to dinner, everybody kept asking me, "Who is this Silverberg that you're going to fire next Wednesday?" <laughs> so, um, but I, I found out later that he's an avid hiker, and he probably. Um, so, uh, big, oh, Macho guy, I thought you could do it. Oh my God, I did. It was, I, I've not been that scared in 50 years. It is terrible. I was beaten up by some bullying in grammar school. It is terrifying. <laughs> All right, thank you. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. All right, let's get our fun portion of this, Dr. Glazer. All right. First of all, thank you, Dr. Willis, for having me the first pick. I was able to pick uh, my topic, and Dr. Lucchese got stuck with the opposite view. Also, thank you, Dr. Lucchese, for providing all the references. I didn't listen because they're pretty much the same two and a half papers in the last 30 years. You know, we all do the same search. So, antibiotics will serve as facial fractures. You call them a fast consult. If you're at least a PGY2 resident in the emergency department, you can write this consult. They always say, give antibiotics and avoid nose blowing and acting for three days, and that's a mild humiliation, right? It's pretty much, I think, like standard consult. They probably give them a template during their orientation. And you go to your ER for the facial practice. What is it? Good book, Tintinelli. Well, I found it. Two statements. Antibiotic therapy is indicated for mandibular fractures. Consider antibiotics if there's a significant ocular edema. Significant, define what you feel significant, right? What are the recommendations? What is the actual data? Luckily for us, the Society of Surgical Infection in July 2020, which is basically a month ago, published uh, their recommendations. They published it in their journal. So far, it's available online. It's not available in the journal itself, but you can see. And that pretty much answers the questions we need. They put that five questions. And the answer was no. What are the five questions? A, do we give, again, it is prophylactic. Prophylactic antibiotic for non-operable mid-phase, upper phase, or mandibular Do we give prophylactic antibiotic for preoperative uh, for non-mandibular facial fractures? Do we give prophylactic antibiotics preoperatively for mandibular fractures? And the last two questions are not really relevant for us, but just 
FOI data that we give post operative antibiotic, which is defined antibiotic for more than 24 hours for both non mandibular fractures, which they took to work, and for mandibular fractures. They did not discuss perioperative, which is a third kind of antibiotic that they give like during surgery. So that's when I say more than 24 hours, that's considered post -hour. As I mentioned, the answer was no. We really care about the three questions, first three questions. One is, question one is non-operable fracture. So look at the three studies, and two studies, and some was already mentioned by Dr. Lucchese, there were no infections. They just didn't, there were no infections, or they couldn't prove, like, the antibiotic, uh, use whether it's helpful or not, because no one got any infection. In one study, there was some infection, however, it was an interesting study. This was a study on patients with non-operable traumatic facial injuries who were admitted to ICU, because obviously they had some other serious injuries. And they found that if people ever, ever got antibiotic, in, in a short course antibiotic, they had a 3% infection rate, patient. And the one which were giving antibiotic for longer times actually got 5%. So that's, based on that, they concluded there is no need to give prophylactic antibiotics for non-operative fractures. Question two, do we give uh, prophylactic antibiotics for the fractures uh, of a mid and upper phase, not mandibular fractures, who we're planning to take to OR? They could only find two studies, low quality, low numbers, they were like, Design was kind of crazy. They tried pre and perioperative, perioperative, post operative, pre and post, perioperative, and pre and post, not perioperative. I mean, there were so many arms with so few patients. But the short story the only people who got infection were people with the open fractures or mandibular fractures, which were not part of the question because this, they used the study to look at the non mandibular fractures. So, based on that, the Surgical Infection Society's recommendation currently is. We do not want to give prophylactic antibiotics for operative uh, non mandibular fracture. And the last question, relevant for us, question number three do we give antibiotic, prophylactic antibiotics for mandibular fractures, which we're planning to repair? Again, they, they looked at it, there was some meta analysis, however, they combined preoperative and perioperative antibiotics, so they said we're not going to look at those because. At this point, it is considered to be a standard of care to give perioperative antibiotics when somebody getting a repair of their mandibles. So what about preoperative? There was four studies, all retrospective. Three studies had negative. So they basically, they showed there was no difference in infection rate. And one was, they call it a positive study. However, it was a kind of weird, again, weird study. Everybody got antibiotics, they looked at the a percentage of people who got infection depending on how quickly they give antibiotics from the time of the injury. There was a one arm less than eight hours, the second arm between eight hours and actually 72 hours, and then the last arm, if the first dose of antibiotic were given more than 72 hours of injury. And they, they said, okay, we get 5% of the people who got antibiotic quickly got infection. And, and 24% of uh, people who got antibiotics with more than 74 hours got infected. Hmm. Looks like a positive study. However, look at the numbers. In the first arm, we had 240 people. In the, in the third arm, which is basically more than 72 hours, there were only 37 people. So it's not, you can't really compare those. And uh, another thing is that those people, those are really unlucky people who got antibiotics more than 72 hours for trauma. 76% of them got serious complications overall. So it's not just infection. I'm not sure what happened to those people, but out of those like uh, 37 people, most people got significant complications. So we really can't call it. And they didn't call either. So based on their review of the four studies, their recommendation is do not give prophylactic antibiotics for mandibular fractures, which uh, you're planning to repair. So conclusion. Infections, do they happen? Yes. Infections can and do happen in patients with facial fractures, and there's an increased rate in open fractures, and as I mentioned, mandibular fractures, which are open to oral cavity or extending through a fracture tube. Now, I think open fractures should be probably taken in the current, uh, category by itself. It's, they're not open. If you're working up in the ER, we don't see many open fractures, and they probably should be treated like all the other open fractures and not combined with a are closed fractures. 
and mandible fractures which are open oral cavity or extending through fracture tooth need to be looked into it. Probably you need more data because those are uh, basically open to the mouth, which is uh, full of different bacteria. But for most other uh, uh, fractures, infections are quite uncommon. Current literature does not support a blood prophylactic antibiotic, both for operative and non-operative management. Clearly, there are research opportunities because in serious doctors, we want no one to get infection. So maybe identifying appropriate population, seeing what intervention we can do might be helpful. But at this point, I think uh, we should not be using antibiotic, A, and B, I think we have a pretty strong statement which support. Before we really didn't have a, a statement, now a surgical infection society, you can show it to your colleagues, it's a pretty much strong statement. It's, a, it's not just some paper, it's a guidelines of the society. It's not ENT society, it's not all surgery society, it's surgical infection society, but it publishes a lot of different guidelines on antibiotic prophylaxis and treatment for different surgical infections. And I think this is something you can show to your colleagues should the discussion occur. But I think at this point, I have, we have enough evidence on that part. Now let's move to the antibiotics of anterior nasal packing. By the way, that's a real packing. Uh, when we talk about nasal packing and all the studies originally done, this is the packing we have done. And actually, you'd be surprised how many feet of packing you can put in nose. You, have, you can put like a three to five feet of the packing in the average nose. Mine, you probably put a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Tradition. That's why I was told as a resident. Give a script for a few Catholic spills. If it's good for a fish, if it's good for a dog, it's gonna be good for your nose, right? Catholic is good for everything, right? From pregnant UTI to wonder the crap. The good book. The good book warns us complications of packing include sinusitis and also rare toxic shock syndrome. So we do. What do we do? Another new study, like, like similar to the July combination from surgical infection, we have another study which we can use, which was published just in May in American Journal of Emergency Medicine, prophylactic antibiotic for anterior nasal packing in the emergency department, systematic review and meta-analysis of clinical significant infection. Five articles met of inclusion criteria, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure they were all under Dr. Lucchetti's slides, trust me, there's nothing there. They combined 383 patients in those five studies, out of them 42% did not have, did not receive antibiotics. They looked at the data and they concluded that numbers needed to treat to prevent one infection is 571. I do not want you to remember that number. I don't know why they decided to do it. I guess they just want to show us that they know how to do statistics. Uh, in reality, basically what happened, they look at the five studies. There were 383 people. And they look how many people got infection with antibiotic or without. Each arm had one patient. One patient got infection on antibiotics and one patient got it without. But remember, but unfortunately, they were not 50-50. 42% who did not receive antibiotics. It means 58% got antibiotics. Which they calculate the rate, I mean, because it's, they needed to put some statistics, it's one patient. So they said, okay, it looks like a, the infection rate in people who got antibiotics is 0.45%. And that one person out of 42% is 0.625%. Yes. And, and because I guess it looks better if we publish more data, they said, okay, so the absolute reduction is 0.125, 1.75%. They didn't stop. They said, let's calculate the number needed to treat. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I agree with the study. Most people just do not get antibiotics or that doesn't get infection. And the numbers are so low, it's almost impossible to calculate the difference. But based on one, just nice exercise in statistics, just to show you what you can do with one patient in the arm. You can actually calculate and then see and come up with like 571. So do not remember that number. Just remember, very low rate, no difference. Just for you to look at it, uh, student criteria, they really try. They look at the, not just prospective and retrospective studies, they will look at the case series. They really try to look hard and the data is just not there. They look at several hundred and they barely got five articles. And from them, they got two people with infection, one on each side. So, no retrospective reviews of prospective studies which show benefit of antibiotics. Also, most of the studies are older and now we have a lot of new packing. 
Actually, there are two studies when the Maricel came in 1990s. They were looking at Maricel and Staphylococcus, and at least in vitro, it appears that Maricel itself suppresses Staphylococcal growth. So we really can com cannot compare that old packing, which I showed you, which was a lot of studies, including Toxic Shack, on this old packing, and we have all these new packings coming every year. Is it the same or not? Finally, Toxic Shock Syndrome. That's what everybody afraid of. That's what you talk to ENT and I talk to my facial plastic colleague and tell like, we don't want Toxic Shock. There was no report of Toxic Shock in people who got anterior packing for epistaxis. All those reports were for nasal surgeries, including, or almost exclusively, for uh, septal, basically, people who deviate na uh, nasal septum, septoplasm. Those are the people who were all reported. And those are different cases from us. If you, ever, if you want to know what septoplast is and you don't know, you can look at them on YouTube. They're making, in the dirty nose, full of bacteria, two incisions, they dissect to the cartilage, they take the cartilage out, then they took a hammer and they break a pieces of bone, they irrigate, they close. It's a pretty, I mean, small but it's extensive procedure which is involving cartilage and bone. And other react, uh, cases from the packing or the surgery, I'm not sure. But this, they're very different from you packing a nose, which the only because of opening is this little hole from which there is a, you get a epistaxis. I think it's quite a different case. Again, the toxic shock, only after no nasal surgery. The case reports, and every case report give you, and even right, like even any review give you this number, 16 and a half cases per 100,000 Every case, as well, but the toxic shock we're getting 16 and a half cases per 100,000. I decided to look, how do you get to 16 and a half per 100,000 cases? Because nobody questioning, that's the number. That's how they got it. Instead of Utah, the researchers basically uh, consulted in the 1980s, there's Utah, Utah Medical State Society Directory. They found 42 ENT surgeons who are members. They called them. One of them didn't talk to them. 41 surgeons uh, agreed to talk to the researcher. They asked two questions. How many nose jobs did you do in four years? And do you recall any toxic shock syndrome? Together, all those 41 surgeons in four years from 1980 to 83 did 18,190 cases. One of them recalled one case, another surgeon recalled two cases. Three cases out of 18,190 uh, cases of uh, ENT surgeons who were 1985 members of a uh, medical society for now, and any literature, including in some other, like Spanish and Polish language, upon everybody quoting that this, uh, the case of toxic shock is 16 and a half per 100,000. So just be aware about those numbers. Nobody knows what the real stuff is about. The other thing I just want to point out, like, uh, they were all after uh, uh, sept uh, deviation surgeries, and the answer because I did a quick description of cases. Same afternoon, four hours after surgery, 12 hours after surgery. All those cases were pretty severe cases, in other words, young, healthy people, they will really start within a few hours of the, those extensive nasal septal surgery. And I'm not really sure whether we can attribute to that uh, packing being in their nose. It's just, to me, it looks very quickly. It may be something which happened during the surgery, which caused them to go into the Okay, this is the same, I apologize, same slide as Dr. Lucchese put. This is a uh, statement by the American Academy of Colorado Head and Neck Surgery, the journal, Colorado Head and Neck Surgery, clinical practice guide on nose blades. Same thing, you already mentioned it. Look at the language. They said that several studies suggest that the packing should not be mandatory. They're not even talking about optional or necessary. They still try to understand how some people might think it's not mandatory. And the advice kind of softly against it. So just be aware of where ENT your colleague are coming from because they're reading their recommendations and their authority is just saying, well, some people are thinking it's not mandatory, but we think it's great. So conclusion, no evidence that antibiotic use in patients on tail packing reduce the incidence of sinusitis or toxic shock. Syndrome. We're not even sure whether such thing as toxic shock syndrome in the people who receive packing for epistaxis exists. There are plenty of evidence, obviously, and we need to give it to you here that it's not benign. And finally, expect resistance from ENT colleagues. 
it's still very controversial in their society guys. That's pretty much it. I just want to thank Dr. Lucchese and Dr. Glazer for uh, starting off the faculty and controversy uh, lecture. I uh, let Dr. Glazer pick the topic, but I didn't tell him he was going to be uh, debating against the chair of the department. So <laughs> I uh, kind of bamboozled both of them. Um, I just kind of want to give a wrap up to this and maybe uh, have some sort of poll or kind of conversation if we have, we have about five minutes left. Um, so I think in this case, there's a lack of uh, positive evidence. And as Dr. Zatopshi pointed out, even the evidence out there is it appropriate or is it right? So I think when it comes down to it, so what do we do with this? I think you have to use your clinical judgment and practice. Uh, but at the same time, I guess the big thing that we have to deal with is that our experts and our consultants seem to be squarely on the side of using antibiotics. So I guess I'll pose it to some of the seniors, the faculty in the room. What, what do you do on a regular basis? It's a, it was almost like dogma that anterior packing gets antibiotics. Hearing kind of the opposite. They want to volunteer. So they do. I, I could, I could, I could start off by saying, I never, ever, ever do something because I'm afraid of black. I'm going to get consultants. Right. In fact, when I quote two very reputable uh, otolaryngologists on campus, they both said, "Oh, throw our hands up in the air every time you people send us somebody to move the anterior packing representative." And they weren't on antibiotics, you know. And I, and I just said, you have to show me the literature. And that was over a week ago. And he's the one who really gave it the science. <laughs> so anytime that there isn't good data, I think you're going to get what your society says. Here's what you've been taught. That's that's the problem. And I guess you could you could be the devil devil's advocate there and say, but if you wanted to be on the spectrum of practice where I don't want to be that one toxic shock or that one that infection, but I think, uh, and it was in Dr. Blazer's last slide, you have to be aware that antibiotics are benign uh, therapy as well. Don? I was going to say, I think it comes down to the, our specialists are worried about their one organ system. And then antibiotics will have a downside. So all we're looking at is this will definitely prevent toxic shock. We're not as worried about But half these patients are going to have GI upset and have this other thing. Antibiotics and put that. In fact, one of the, the, the studies I put up there, which was garbage, you know, and it gave antibiotics for more than seven days, one of the patients uh, got C. diff. So I, I think well, a lot of times, too, like I, I have the conversation with them. Last time I think it was a touch checker, like there's a head wants to discharge the start of antibiotics. We're like, the, you know, the scale's very vascular. We don't really feel strongly about this. And then we said, if you want the patient to be on it, we encourage you to send it. Yeah, almost, almost invariably, every study that looks at antibiotic for uh, 
the treatment or prophylaxis of anything completely under support the, the side effects of antibiotics, right? Because the side effects usually happens mostly after the, the, the follow-up period, which is days, or they go somewhere else, and or they're not really interested. But invariably, they are under. They look at infection. They only care about an infection or not infection. And then a lot of times the studies will show that, oh, maybe there's slightly less infection. And that's the only that's the only endpoint they're really looking at when we should really be looking at the other side. So I'll be honest, I never thought twice about giving antibiotics because that's what we always did. And I'm a big fan of not doing what we always did. Um, so um, I'm a little disappointed that I never thought about this before. Um, and I don't know what I would do in the future. I guess, I mean, I never thought about, it was always kind of dogma. It's in the books, it's always what I've been taught that you pack a nose, you give antibiotics, otherwise they're for sure going to get uh, toxic shock syndrome. Um, but when, when you think about it, um, you know, um, you obviously don't want to leave it in for a long time. Obviously, the longer it's in there, but these packages are probably not in there for more than a, a day or two. Um, and um, there's a lot of women out there who are using tampons, and we don't see a lot of toxic shock syndrome. I know we talk about, um, you know, there were tampons a long time ago that in increased the risk of toxic shock syndrome. But I, and women are supposed to take out the tampons every day, or whatever. But there are a lot of women out there doing this on a regular basis on their own, and we're not seeing toxic shock syndrome coming in on a regular basis. So how common is it really, and is it worth the downside of antibiotics? And something I never thought about, but maybe we should think about. And uh, uh, Dr. Barron, I think your uh, point is what I was going to say. Do you want to verbalize it? Uh, uh, Dr. Barron's on, on uh, she said, to play devil's advocate, if practice is based on expert opinion and you deviate and the patient has a bad outcome, then potential legal ramifications, which I think is a valid point. So that, that, I think we're, we're basing this on expert opinion. There's no evidence one way or the other. So I think it has to come down to what your what your clinical practice is and how much risk you're able to take. And I think you should think about the patient in front of you as well, in terms of um, will they be responsible to take out their own packet or follow up in two days? Uh, what are their comorbidities? How, and the fracture that you're looking at or the situation? From um, expert opinion is if it's not based on anything, it's just, right? If everybody always gives antibiotics and nobody ever sees somebody with an actual infection from it, then how is it possibly expert opinion? We're just calling it expert opinion, but it's not actually expert opinion. So experts said to do it, so yeah. it is just not based on anything. There's a lot of things that experts say to do that are actually patently false, right? Like in the guidelines, there's guidelines that are, are completely non-evidence based, but it's a bunch of experts in a room saying something, and that's the problem with expert opinion. A lot of times it's a bunch of experts saying the same thing that's been said for a hundred years. I agree with the like expert opinions. It may be wrong, but it's like well, right. well, but the expert opinion also, and, and are they responsible for the C. diff? Right? So I, I, we're the, I, I think we're the final judge of what happens after a consultant. So a consultant it just gives an opinion. We're the ones who take the action, and we're the ones who take the responsibility at the end of it. So I think it's up to us to make these big decisions. We ask a consultant a question, and they give us an answer. We don't have to accept the answer. Yeah, let's, us. let's do, uh, Robbie, you want to just make the one last comment? And I, I think we got to wrap up. I think, Robbie, just put in the chat just uh, about incorporating shared decision making. We're just talking. Yeah, I was going to say. Go, go ahead, go. <laughs> I need it. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Really? Okay. I was gonna ask, it's a little loud. Sorry. I was going to ask for the role of shared decision making. Um, I know it's kind of like a hot thing to say, like, oh, let's just do shared decision making. But how specifically would you do shared decision making for this topic when it's, we just spent like a half hour debating this? How would you explain this to a patient? And would you incorporate shared decision making for this subject? I, I think I think it's uh, in my opinion. I think it's not a bad idea, but uh, as you as you just kind of highlighted the fact that we're having a in-depth conversation about this, I don't know if a patient could have the knowledge and background to 
to fully kind of weigh in and on, on this in terms of shared decision. I still think it works here because they, they just want advice for everything. Yeah. Even when it's not indicated, so <laughs> they're going to ask for it probably. No, I think the case is a sharing decision is a little bit, now it's mentioned for everything that I mentioned. I think often people try to share like their legal responsibility with the patient, but in reality, if you ask the question, how often do you actually explain something and say, what do you want? And they look and say, you're the doctor, what do you think? So at some point after like explain the patient, you have to tell them your opinion, not just, in some cases it's okay to say it either way, but in something like this, like, do you take it or not? Patients will most likely ask you, do you think I need an antibiotic? And asking them, you are the doctor, you know, what do you want to take antibiotics? No, no, what, what do you? I actually think this is a good one for shared decision making because you can talk to them about like what the risks and side effects are. Like you can tell them, you know, these are the reasons why they're concerned. This is what we're concerned about. This is, you know, pretty uncommon. This is why I think this, maybe your trauma is more likely to have a problem or really less likely. I think they can have a role in saying like, I'm concerned about, that, about having diarrhea and C. diff versus like, I'll watch myself really closely and come back if anything happens. Or I'm gonna follow up very reliably. I'm like, I don't wanna take the risk of it. Great.